so this morning we're going to close out our study of Jeremiah. And uh, so I kind of, you know, God just delivers messages to you in your, in your, in your time, in your place, where you are. Uh, and, and I wanted to say crazily, um, because of this, because of ALS, we've got people that are watching our, whatever you call what we do, uh, our feed. Um, Dwight puts it out there, and now it's public. And we had like, what did you, what did you just? I mean, that's crazy. So, so we need to do a better job. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You you need to do a better job. No. Uh, so um, so it's kind of exciting time as God uses what's going on. And um, so the word this morning that I wanted to talk to you about Jeremiah 44, as we close out. So we know what's going on. Israel um, is has been messed up, taken over. Judah has been. In battle, Jeremiah over and over again as the voice of the Lord saying, stop doing what you're doing. Get your life right. Get on track. Because if you don't, God is going to send the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, and things are not going to be good. And three times they get attacked and destroyed. And the temple gets destroyed ultimately because they would not turn from their evil, wicked ways. And so as I was going through different chapters this week, just saying, okay, Lord, we're... Uh, I came to Jeremiah 44. And as I was thinking through things, a lot of things have been, I'm getting reached out to by, I mean, Rick and Bubba, apparently they have a lot of listeners. Because I'm getting reached out from people, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, and so many people are misguided. They're misguided and their anger is against a wonderful creating God who when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And they're mad at Him. And as I was doing this lesson again and just saying, God, where, what's going on? Where? It just struck me that what's happened is travesty. Satan has manipulated. Travesty has turned to tragedy. Now what is travesty? Anybody know? Anybody want to take it? What's that? What? Yeah, yes, yes. Greg played football at Georgia Tech, and so uh, that is a travesty. Uh, travesty. That's actually a tragedy. That's a tragedy. That would be correct. Travesty is this misguided, misinformed, confused state where understanding reality and truth gets so bogged down, so manipulated, so misinterpreted that it's just the ability to communicate just implodes. And what happens is that's Satan. Satan is the author of travesty. And he uses travesty to generate tragedy. Because tragedy is when all the events come together and there's a boom. There's an explosion. And things have gotten so messed up and out of whack. And mindsets are so off kilter with the truth of the God who created everything that there's disaster. And I mean, our lives, we could go around here talking about Disaster after disaster after disaster. And people are reaching out to me and they want to talk about disaster. And I'm wanting to talk about the travesty. See, we, we like to run to the tragedy, to the event. But what this book does is says, hey, I, God, Jeremiah is screaming to them before the tragedy hits, before it happens, Fix the, tra the travesty. Because if you get truth right, if you get truth right, and you get your, your attitude adjusted 
to what God's holy design for your soul is? Well, tragedies come and go. But they don't stick to you. They don't hold you. They don't bind you. You know why? Because the author of death has no touch on me and has no touch on you if you're right in your soul and in your belief and not living a life of travesty but a life of truth and correction. And so God, through Jeremiah, goes and He's talking to the to the guys, the Judeans who are now in Egypt, and, and let's go down to verse 2 of 44. He says this, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the disaster that I brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. Behold, this day they are, desol they are desolation, and no one dwells in them. Well, the world, a lot of people that are reaching out to me, that's their story. That's all they know about their story. I've seen tragedy, I've seen problem, I've seen, and, and for generations, my family, and unfortunately, once tra uh, travesty gets into, and, and the sin that comes from it, and the evil that comes from it, once it sets into a family, it's hard to break. And for generations, suffering takes place. Abuses take place. And all they do is they see that story. Well, God wiped out the city. Well, it's a desolate place. What kind of God is that? They stop short of verse 3. Because. Whenever you see because, and you're going to see because, and you're going to see therefore, and I don't know where you are this morning, if you're asleep, you're awake, you slept good, you didn't. I don't know what's going on in your life. But what I'm asking you to do, whether you're watching or you're here, I want you to hear this. Because and therefore are critical words. Because it connects us to what takes place and puts the reality of the situation right in our face. Because of the evil that they committed, provoking me, provoking God to anger, and that they went to make offerings and serve other gods that they knew not, neither they nor you nor your fathers. They're serving and seeking something they haven't a clue about. And I'm telling you, it's out there rampant in this world. It's not so much they're rejecting God, they don't even know who God really is. It's not that they're really rejecting Jesus, they just don't know who He is. And so they're serving something, and you finally get to the point where you say, well, you know, that's your God. Whatever you're thinking happens, that's your God. And they don't really even know what that is. They've never connected with the soul that God gave them that is eternal. And so our challenge is how do we take those conversations deeper? How do we understand what's behind the tragedy and understand the travesty? It says, because of the evil that they committed, provoking God. Now, if you're provoked, what do you do? Okay. There's an action that takes place. I don't know why God did it. I, don't, I have no idea. But I know this. He put us in the garden and gave us a choice. And said, I'm giving you a choice. And your choice matters. Your prayers matter. Your pleading to the Lord matters. Your pursuit of God matters. Your relationship with God matters. I mean, we know this. For some, those that don't believe in the Lord, it doesn't work out for good. That's God's fault. The, the evil, and I'm not talking about an individual situation. I'm talking about in a broader situation. This whole nation of both Israel and Judah are suffering because of the, the actions or inactions of the broadness of their nation. There were people in those, we know there were people in those, country, in those nations that were prophets that were seeking the Lord with everything they got. I mean, poor Jeremiah is just over and over again. Guys, just listen. 
please just listen. And they wouldn't. So for some of us, for some, right now, the statement is just listen. If, you've, if you're listening to the words that I'm saying, and to this point you're like, well, blah, 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 blah. Just listen. I guarantee you, if you could go back in time and talk to the Judeans, I bet they would say, man, if we had only listened to Jeremiah, if we'd only listened to what God said through Jeremiah, things may have been different. Just listen. And he's going to say that in a minute. Watch this. Watch this. So in verse 4, he says this. God says this. In the midst of all that evil, which is the tragedy, in the midst of all that evil, yet I, yet God, persistently sent to you all my servants, the prophets, saying, Oh, do not do this abomination that I hate. What does persistently mean? So who is, who is the persistent one in this? Who? Think about your life. I don't know about y'all, but I've been off track more than once. I've lost my focus. I've made mistakes. Well, I sin every day through act or inact, through mentality. And God persistently, persistently, Think about that word. These, so many people say, well, God did this and I'm in a desolate place. And, this is, and the reality is in that moment, God is persistently reaching out to them. Persistently. Once and for all, Jesus, He expressed His love for us. We couldn't do it for ourselves. So He said, I'll leave perfection in heaven and go down to that junk place where chaos rules and, and Satan is the prince of the world and I'm going to go down there and I'm going to show him the spiritual battle of the soul and I'm going to win the victory through holiness, perfection, and sacrifice on the cross and I'm going to save their souls. And persistently, he's reaching out. Wherever you are in your journey, right now I'm telling you, he is persistently, he's right there with you saying, go to the next step. Get closer to Jesus persistently over and over and over and over. Jeremiah says, hey, I've got a word from the Lord. Just listen. I've got a word from the Lord. Just listen. I got... That's what he's doing here. I've got a word from the Lord. Just listen. God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's paid the price. He's taken care of it. He's got a plan and a purpose. But His plan is not going to work in your life if you're not plugged into His plan. It's just not. All things work for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Love Him and called according to His purpose. You can't sit back and just let the Laissez-faire, is that the word? Is that a, that's a good word. A good word. What does that mean? Nonchalant. Yeah, you can't nonchalantly just go through life and say, hey, whatever, hands in pocket, whatever. Because let me tell you what happens in the land of whatever. Satan comes in and sets travesty that's going to lead to tragedy in your life. That's what happens. Get your hands out of your pockets. Get your fists ready to go. Get your hands open with whatever you have to give. But be ready to be a warrior for the Lord and things change. Tragedy still comes. You may get diagnosed with ALS, but you know what? It's okay. Because my soul is good. I'm at peace. Wow. He persistently comes after him. It says... Uh, he calls it an abomination. What, what is the abomination? What are they doing? What's the, what's the tra tra tragedy that's going on? What's he telling them? 
Y'all study along. Come on. Huh? Sacrifice. Sacrificing other gods. Sacri they're sacrificing, making offering. They're worshiping other gods. Little g. What's the first commandment given to Moses? What did Jesus uh, so louder, Lynn? No, no, no other gods before me. What did Jesus say the greatest commandment is? Love the, Love the who? Lord. The Lord your God. The Creator God. Yahweh, love Him with all your heart, mind and soul. Everything you got is the priority of God that created you. You go and connect to the God of that wall, it ain't going to do you any good. You can worship Him all day long. I remember going to, I think it was Thailand, and they're Buddhist. They worship all kinds of stuff. And man, it's some, it's some odd stuff. You look at some of the pictures of who they worship, and I'm like, wow. Somebody was smoking something when they came up with that God. If you're Buddhist, I'm sorry, but seek the truth. <laughs> They put stuff, isn't it Buddhists that put stuff in the mailbox? Or they don't call it a mailbox. They call it a, or is that Hindu? That's the postman. No, <laughs> it's not the postman. It's Hindu or, they, they have these offering boxes. They look like mailboxes. And they'll put rice out there and like, uh, they put stuff in there to, to give to their God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. Hindu, okay. Because um, a lot of people are looking at me like I was really crazy, and I'm like, no, I've seen it. I've got, I just can't remember. Okay. And, and so they got this box, and they look like mailboxes, but they're full of, there's a lot of, like, ants. Because here's the thing that never happens. Their God never receives their offering. And I talked to young kids that were in their 20s, and they're like, I don't get how we're hungry and yet we take our rice and we put it in a box. And all it does is ruin. You know why? Because they've been duped into a travesty that's going to lead to a, trage a tragedy in their lives. It's an abomination that God hates when you put other gods in front of Him. When you make something a priority that's not meant to be a priority. When you take what He's given you for good and you abuse it and you make it more important than your relationship with God. I don't care if it's your spouse, which is tremendously important. If your relationship with God is not right, your relationship with your spouse is never going to be right. Kids, jobs, sports, teams, it doesn't matter what it is, it does not need to surpass your love and understanding and relationship with God Almighty, your Creator God. Test yourself. He says it's an abomination. Now for time's sake, I'm going to skip down a little bit. I'm going to skip five because I'm going to close with, with verse five and verse ten. He says in verse six, he says, Therefore my wrath and my anger were pounded were poured out and kindled in the cities, and they became a waste and desolation as at this day. And now thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, in verse 7, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? I thought, man, that's a powerful, that's a powerful verse. See, the evil in placing a little God above the God It hurts a lot of people, but it is an evil upon yourself. You're digging your own hole. Frankly, you're digging your own eternal grave. That's why God says it's an abomination and He hates it because you, who He's created, are self-inflicting your own wounds. What would you do if I brought a knife in this week and just started stabbing myself. Would you look and think, well, that's smart. What if I said, well, my, I'm just using the God, my knife. My knife is going to be my God. 
and just worshiping it. What would you think? You would think he is insane. His insanity is a travesty because he's not using the knife for what it's meant to be. He's worshiping a created item instead of the creator and he's hurting himself. And I would hope that somebody would say, stop doing that. In this temporal world, that's what people are doing with their eternity. That's what they're doing. Somebody needs to say stop. And God wants to use us to be His persistent instrument and warrior for His kingdom. His anger is stirred by our evil. But he doesn't leave us without hope. Because he tells us in here, there's five things that he says, this is what they're doing wrong. And so conversely, if we do the opposite of what they're doing wrong, now we're on this side of the cross, so Jesus is our, our source of salvation, saved by grace, through faith, through faith, through faith. But these five things I would submit to you show our faith, reflect our faith. Grow in our faith. And he says these are the five things. And these are the verses that I would suggest you circle and just study on this week. In verse 5 he said, But they did not what? Or what? What's the difference between just listening and inclining their ear? There's a reason the Bible puts that in kind of in duplicative form. Did I say that right? duplicated form. Listen and incline your ear. What's the difference? Listen is the, is the catch. Lord, I, I, I hear you. I need to get in the Word. And I'm listening. But as I listen in the Spirit, I'm drawn to something deeper. How many times have you gone, well, we do it when we prepare Sunday school. When I read this the first time, I was like, God, there's something there. Because I was listening. But then that catch in verse 5 and verse 10, all of a sudden I would incline my ear. And I'm reading it over and over and over. Saying, God, what are you trying to tell me in this? Inclining your ear. Go deep with the one that created you. Go deep with the one that saved you. Get to know him more and more and deeper than you've ever known him before. He said, they did not listen and incline their ear to turn from their what? Evil and make no offerings to other gods. So they didn't, the first thing that they didn't do that we know we need to do is listen and incline our ear. And then when you listen and incline, guess what he's telling you? He's telling you Stop the travesty. You're being duped by Satan, the evil one. And he's trying to throw you off course. And when you start to listen and incline your ear, if they had just listened to Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, what does God have for us? And they had inclined their ear, all of a sudden they'd heard, they would hear something, but then there's something that is required once you're inclined to listen to God. And that is, you turn from your from your travesty to His truth. Woo! That makes all the difference. That's when you wake up in the morning and things are just as chaotic as they were the day before. But just listen. Just listen. You breathe. And you say, this is the day the Lord has made. What? Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever, it's, whatever befalls me. Nothing, nothing more can overtake me with the power of Jesus. He will not leave me. He will not forsake me. He will not put more on me than I can handle by His grace and with His hand. It will definitely be more than I can handle. But because of Jesus, we got this. 
only do you experience that when you listen and incline your ear and turn from the travesty that the world has for us. And then in 10, he says they didn't do this either. They have not what? What? Louder. Humbled themselves. Humbled themselves. They have not humbled themselves. They have not said, hey, God, let me listen to you. Because perhaps this is right. Perhaps this is correct. Now, I'm telling you, I know for a fact it is, but you've got to come to that conclusion in your own relationship, but just pursue it. Just pursue it. Listen and incline your ear. Turn your ways to start going His way, and you'll find humility because you realize you're not anything but flesh and bones. And a soul, a soul that can only be fed by God Almighty. Flesh and bones, we are withering away. I'm a living example. I tried to get on a jet ski yesterday after having made a mistake of trying to get on one from the dock. I was with Jordan. I said, buddy, let me just jump off because I, I want to be able to ride a jet ski by myself. Well, it ain't going to happen. My 22-year-old son, man, he had to just drag and People were watching because the show was incredible. My bathing suit's falling off. And <laughs> I'm just trying. I finally get my feet onto the, to the step. And he says, Dad, all right, just, stay, just stand up. My mind was saying, stand up. But my legs wouldn't straighten. We are all withering away. But our soul, God, our soul is so rich. And God put the breath of life in us. And He's the only source that revives that soul and gives us strength when we're weak. God, my uncle, passed away. And I'm sitting there thinking, in that minute, in that second, he's in the presence of God Almighty. And there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no consequence of a stroke. That's our God. Man, that humbles me. That God would love me enough. He says, humble themselves. They, they didn't humble themselves. We need to humble ourselves. Even on this day, nor, in verse 10, nor have they feared. Nor have they feared. Some people are so angry at God, they have no respect for God. And Satan has duped them. And if you believe that or you feel that, I'm telling you, Satan is your enemy. And he is lying to you and deceiving you. And he's using everything. He, he's the prince of this world. And he's manipulating. And he's causing travesty in your life. And you need, you need to stop and just say, I rebuke you, Satan. And in the name of Jesus, get behind me. Get out of my face. And I'm going to fear the one that created me. Fear meaning I respect the fact that he could wipe me out. I respect the fact that He created me and He can do whatever He wants to, but I respect the fact that He's loved me so much that He's already paid the price to provide me salvation. Man, that fearing the Lord. And then the last thing that He says in verse 10 is He said, Nor have walked in my laws or my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Some listening. Part of their issue is their fathers. If the father never gets it right, if the mother never gets it right, the chains never get broken. He says, walk, walk in my ways. 
So my prayer is that you'll look specifically at these verses, but specifically at 5 and 10 in Jeremiah 44. And you'll think about these five things. And wherever you are, you'll take that next step in these five things to plug in and go deeper in God's Word and see what He does with your life. Because I guarantee you it gets real exciting. Because He is a mighty, powerful God. Donald, will you close us in prayer this morning? Sure. Loud so they can, yep. they can hear you. you got 500 people listening to you. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, we thank you for this opportunity to, to be together and just uh, hear these great words of wisdom that, that you give to us through Jordy. Uh, we thank you, uh, dear Lord, for your presence in our lives, and we ask that you just take your spirit in each of us and stir us this week to, uh, to know you, to turn to you, uh, and to follow you, and to know that you are present, uh, to know that with your power all things are possible, and we just lift you up. And Lord, uh, I take time to just lift Jordy and his family up to you this week as he travels to uh, the Mayo Clinic. We ask for uh, safe travels. We uh, ask for uh, the treatment to go well. Uh, give him rest and give him comfort. Uh, and we just uh, just ask blessings over, over their family. Dear Lord, we thank you for your son, the gift of your son, the death on the cross, his resurrection, the forgiveness of, his, of our sins through him. And we just pray that you'd be with each of us throughout this week. In your great and your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Y'all have a great week.